This is Abnormal Entertainment. I am a real American. Fight for the rights of every man. I am a real American. Fight for what's right. Fight for your life. You're listening to the No Cry Zone, a progressive political podcast on the Abnormal Entertainment Network. And welcome to the No Cry Zone. Uh, I am here, of course, with John and Rob talking about all things wacky in the world. We have a special guest with us right off the bat, um, uh, running for, I forget the district. It's the 34th House District in Michigan, is that correct, Steve? You did not forget. Ah, excellent. Uh, Steve Green, we, we spoke with Steve before uh, when the uh, city of, uh, well, I should say the state of Michigan discontinued bottled water distribution in the city of Flint. And uh, Steve, you're now one of three Democrats on the ballot uh, come up for the August 7th primary in the 34th district, correct? Uh, yes, sir. I, I think um, I think uh, there are some left-leaning uh, people that are challenging the party establishment uh, incumbent. So, you know, you've, you've been an activist on a number of issues. I know you're, you've d- definitely been for a long time uh, uh, a, a pro-marijuana legalization advocate. Well, uh, a pro, pro-medical cannabis advocate, but uh, I think that uh, uh, legalization of marijuana for adults is, uh, is an important issue because it's in such, such, a, it's in such a terrible place to hurt people. Uh, rather than to help people. So let me ask you this. I mean, th- th- so like you said, medical marijuana has been your main issue. We uh, On the ballot in November, at least at this point in Michigan, we're going to have a, a legalization uh, uh, ballot issue for, for voters to, to come out and, and cast ballots on. Um, is, th- is this a, a big part of your plank, or is that just an it issue? Is. It yeah. is. Okay. Look, um, I, I would not uh, probably be out here uh, beating that drum were it not for that issue uh, 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 being mismanaged by our, our current establishment uh, representatives. Right. Even the Democrats have been very lackluster and not very shining about warming up to this issue. Um, I think that um, They've kind of been chicken a little bit. Uh, they, they've been definitely, oh, uh, you know, even look, look at Debbie Stabenow's position. She's always been a just say no candidate. Um, she's always been anti marijuana. And, um, you know, I'm not going to change Debbie's point of view. Um, and she didn't seem to be gloating about it at the Democratic convention uh, that was doing the nominating. Um, so, I mean, she'll probably, you know, pick it up in a, in, a, in a little more friendly way because the party platform has changed but I want I don't want us to just change and say okay well this is acceptable I want them to embrace this and run run it forward That's I want them to take the ball and move it up the field that's what needs to happen so Steve this is Dave um, so long time I mean, we were, we've got 30 years of uh, uh, just say no misinformation how do you how do you combat that kind of stigma well, I, I would say there's more than 30 years. I think there's probably 100 years of negative stigma towards... Well, I mean, just uh, specifically just say no was, uh, you know, the, the oh, war okay, on drugs. Okay, okay, I got you. Hey, you guys, I've got excited dogs here trying to take advantage of my uh, attention being uh, placed at the telephone instead of at them. Hey. Well, the, well, we'll credit them as special guests as well. I'll bark uh, if necessary. <laughs> right. What's up with the sneezing? <laughs> Oh, there's some giant sneezing happening I've never seen before. Okay. Really? You're right. All right. Good. Sorry about that. Go ahead. Uh, so we were talking about cannabis. Um, we were talking about the stigma of the just say no and how to combat that message that's incredibly pervasive. Well, I think um, I think most of the information is misinformation, or it's information gathered by an agency designed to uh, you know the, the, the study that they do is designed to prop up the, the you know their own existence. You know, most right. of these studies are done by police and DEA who are dependent on this for their bottom lines. You know, um, hey, you know, we don't need so many police because there aren't so many drug crimes to bust anymore. I think that's the fear. And then also, you know, these ridiculous um, uh, search and seizure, you know, the forfeiture laws. 
Right. Uh, the, the police actually went up and, and lobbied the legislature to say to leave to try and leave out the idea of uh, you know making sure that people have a conviction before you can seize people's property and keep it. Right. Um, so, so what's the plan to combat this, though? So, yeah, when you go out to talk to people in your district, and the, it, what are you getting in, in response to this issue? Oh, people are very supportive because they recognize that the uh, war on cannabis uh, in, in general has been a tremendous failure. They have failed to, to neither reduce the uh, demand nor its supply. Um, in all the years that we've been spending huge amounts of public resources on just that, when do we stop doing that and start choosing another way? I mean, that's the that's the feeling I get from people when we talk about this issue generally. Now, there are a lot of people who are definitely, you know, still part of the just say no crowd who just don't get it and don't want to get it because they're not going to educate themselves about it. Um, not going to probably change their mind, but they definitely make up a, a, a minority, uh, a, a very big minority in this district, a minority of in the state in general. So, yeah, so this ballot issue that's coming up in November, uh, I mean, <clears throat> the predictions are, and we all know how well predictions go sometimes, but the predictions are that it's going to pass, uh, Not if not overwhelmingly, it'll pass very comfortably. Um, how, how do you see that? I think it's right. I think it's right in line. Uh, the polling is right in line with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act. Uh, but I think there's a larger impetus in this election cycle to get people to the to the polls, um, given the uh, you know the whole Trump machine going on, that's a whole scary, dangerous thing. Um, but it works to the Democrats' favor in, in, in this cycle. It it, um, it may have been a blessing in disguise, a silver lining to that cloud. So, uh, what other issues? Uh, what other issues are you you know uh, running on uh, in, in the thirty fourth district? Well, clearly, um, you know. Uh, my past appearance on this show uh, was with regards to the water heater. Um, and I think uh, that's still probably the top priority in, in people's points of view about what needs to change or what needs to happen with re representation to uh, effectuate some, some more final uh, answers to the, the looming question about, you know, where is the rest of the money coming from to do this water repair? The state and the federal government um, have had, uh, well, the state got a lot of money from the federal government for this. The state has put some of its own resources aside for this, which they should have because this was their fault in the first place. Um, but there's not enough yet. There's, there's still at least two-thirds of the system that needs to be, you know, dug up and place with these, you know, lead lines going into houses. Um, but, you know, the corrosion is still in the pipeline system. <laughs> um, there's still lead in that pipeline system. It's it's all moving in one direction. It's all coming out of somebody's spigot somewhere. But it's um, it's, it needs a major overhaul. And, you know, the water rates here are the highest in the nation. Uh, you, people still, if you ask them, you know, if I walk around this neighborhood or any other, look, all the water lines here have been replaced in this general neighborhood. Mm -hmm. If I walk around here and ask people about, do you trust the water, uh, they'll tell you no. Mm -hmm. I don't care what their testing says. I don't care what the reports say. I am not drinking that water because, you know, they told us this before, and now my kids got lead poisoned. That's never going to go away. Um, so that's, that's a huge problem. So I, I, there needs to be some answers to this question in a final way. And, and, and the, the, the money needs to come there to back the, the answers. So that's a big question that I have. So I, so you've got three other Democrats on the primary ticket with you, and I guarantee the Republicans are saying the same thing, that, that something has to be done because they're all in district. So uh, what's what's your message specifically with that you were saying, uh, how to get this done? Since everyone's saying something needs to be done, um, what's your plan and what are you telling uh, your voters? Well, there are there are funds available at the state government level to, to take care of this. Like I said, they got a lot of money from the federal government for this. There is zero reason why they can't release those funds to uh, handle this problem. Um, the city's the, the the city's got a terrible problem with this water system, and the only way it can get water rates down is to issue water credits to customers uh, who've been paying on their bills uh, to try and relieve some of that pressure and find a way to lower the rates and increase the service um, 
It's a terrible situation. Look, you really realize how how bad it is until you're without it. Um, and it's a large number of people. It's a huge uh, population here. It's, it's not as big as it was, that's for sure, but there's still a significant number of people living in Flint uh, that have to deal with this on an everyday basis. And I think if, um, if, if you can't get people like me up in there to shake some shake some things loose and, and, and get some dollars committed to this. Because like I said, the state's got money from this in their own coffers. They've got a rainy day fund. They've got other money they can commit to this up from the federal government. They're just not doing it, and it isn't making any sense. So is that, I mean, obviously right now we're living in a state with a Republican governor and a Republican-controlled legislature, uh, which is not at all disposed to really deal with this issue. Um, so come November, I mean, it, it, and this is more of a rhetorical question, uh, you know, we need to see a change in leadership, if not in the governor's mansion, if it also maybe at the, at the legislative level. Well, and you know, yes, and also at the attorney general's level. Um, th- there are uh, a lot of key players that are going to are going to change this election cycle. Um, how it shakes out is going to determine how Michigan moves forward. And I would urge people to get to the polls. And, and no matter where you're at, whether you're Republican or you're Democrat, uh, vote your opinion. It's the only ch- change we have in civic government to make a change in, in, in a realistic way. So many people are disconnected with their whole government via voting. They thought, oh, my vote doesn't really count. No matter what I say, it's gonna, something else is going to happen anyways. I, I, I hope people... Uh, stop dismissing their civic duty to go vote and um, and start going and, and show up, especially these midterm elections, because they're so critical in setting up the uh, the next presidential cycle. Right. Uh, we as Democrats have failed that so many times here in the, in the past. I, I'm hoping that, and I'm, I, I, I firmly believe that that's going to change a little bit this cycle. So, uh, you know, I know uh, before we let you go, you know, we, we, I had talked to you previously about uh, the issue of uh, marijuana legalization. And, you know, it's interesting, you pointed this out, and I hadn't really noticed it until you did, how the opponents of legalization keep referring to it as recreational marijuana. <laughs> and, and so, and you were very, it was very interesting how you pointed out that that's not what is being proposed. So we do not have a recreational uh, marijuana uh, ballot initiative uh, at the polls this fall. We have an adult use cannabis issue before the voters. Uh, you know, to say it's recreational is pejorative in its very foundation. Um, you know, uh, it's adult use cannabis, it's just like liquor would be. You don't call it recreational alcohol. You don't get a recreational alcohol license, um, and the state's not going to be issuing recreational marijuana licenses. They're going to be issuing, you know, state-approved uh, cannabis uh, licenses for sales tax and also for uh, for establishment use. You know, licensed as a, as a, one of these layers. Um, there's uh, some language in the ballot petition that kind of closely mirrors some of the layering that the existing uh, CRMLA, I'm sorry, uh, MMFLA, uh, that's, so there's three things. There's the, there's the uh, Met- Michigan Medical Marijuana Act of 2008. And then in 2016, the legislature passed the MMFLA, which is their answer to the uh, medical marijuana question. Uh, we want to, you know, legitimize this, set up licenses. It's, it's, Boy, they give you a real microscope. They put a real microscope on you. If you're going to apply for one of these licenses, you better be very wealthy. Um, they're going to be applying much that same application to the new marijuana licenses with the CRMLA, which is what's before voters this fall. And um, so they've taken into account the safety aspect and you know the concerns of the opposite side in adopting that. It's just that it won't be run by this crazy appointed you know, third layer of government that the, you know, the Republicans are supposed to be small government, but they put this separate governor-appointed board in place um, with a bunch of uh, people who are anti-cannabis that still have yet, um, two years later, to issue a single license um, to uh, to allow for its, uh, you know, establishment. It's not, it's not been done yet. Um, they're, they're still in pre-approvals. They've given nine pre-approvals on licenses that... Um, that uh, number in application about 500. There's a little over 500 applications in. 
since December. They've given mm-hmm. pre-approvals, meaning that they've, you know, met the, uh, you know, required uh, standards, up to nine of them. Mm-hmm. Um, when are they ever going to issue a light? I, it's, it's my belief, and somebody pointed out to me, that maybe it's the intention of the current government to not issue any of those licenses before uh, they're done and being in control of this issue. Um, that's a terrible statement about, um, that we're talking about medical marijuana here. We're talking about people who need this. These people are already in dire straits. Standard medicine has many times failed them. And medical cannabis offers uh, offers an answer that they're not getting because the state government is uh, busy closing down the method that the people put in place and refuses to enact its, or, you know, per, you know, in a realistic way, its own plan that answers the questions that they want to pose about this. So it's a, it's, it's a lot of information to get across to people if they're interested in finding out. I don't think they are. I think most people want to know, hey, at the end of if I vote this, can, can I smoke marijuana and not have an issue with the law? And the answer is yes. Um, can I grow my own? The answer is yes. Um, can I have it at home without being worried about somebody knocking down the doors or trying to take my kids away? The answer is yes. Um, and, and if you violate one of the one of the many rules in the thing, as as a consumer, not necessarily as a licensee. Um, the worst uh, that can happen is a hundred dollar civil infraction. So there's no jail time. There's no probation. It's the same thing as a parking ticket. You don't. You're not even pay your hundred bucks. You learn your lesson. Go. You know. Next time, don't grow fourteen plants. Grow your twelve. So that's what I'm hoping to see because I'm tired of seeing uh, young lives, especially, being ruined over uh, cannabis. It's so prevalent. Uh, it's crazy to chase around and waste our our precious resources over such a subject. And in a state that is hard up for revenues, right. uh, it would just make sense. And, to, I, yes, well, and I recommend doing that is uh, start speaking to that. Uh, that should be in every speech that you do, how much revenue you uh, support uh, coming to our state and try and get that earmarked for things like opioid crisis prevention and 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 help and things like that because well, I think that's what the big slow up is right now is nobody knows how they're going to steal the money yet. Well, part of the money is already, it's, uh, in in the, in the act it's already determined as to um where that money's going. I mean it's already predestined uh, via the language of the ballot initiative. Uh part of it's going to schools, part of it's going to the um to roads, a uh, part of it's going back to local communities. Uh, that are allowing these licenses to uh, be zoned in their districts. Um, so that's how it's already going to be split. I can't really alter that. If the people voted in, they're going to vote it in based on its basic language. But again, I don't know that the 100-word synopsis that hits the uh, ballots is going to necessarily uh, talk about that. I don't, I've not seen that, the ballot language itself. Well, uh, nonetheless, regardless, it's a, it's a, going to be a big issue this November, and, uh, <clears throat> and of course, for for you, this August is your uh, is your uh, turn at the at the uh, at the ballot. Uh, you're on the thirty fourth Michigan House district uh, up against two other Democrats, and um, <clears throat> we 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 wish you the best, and uh, you know, keep in touch. Let us know how the campaign goes. I definitely will. Thanks, you guys, for having me on today. Absolutely. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Steve. All right. It's very interesting. Um, I'm curious, and this is in... So before you think I'm defending the current administrations here in Michigan or things like that, I wonder, I know, because I don't know, how difficult is it to get a liquor license? Do you guys know? It's expensive. Yeah, I know, I know it's yeah, expensive. Everything's expensive. And, and there's bureaucracy. It's. I wouldn't say it's not difficult, but it's... it's, it's let's put it this way, though. It's less of a risky proposition to get a liquor license than it is to try True. and get a dispensary license. Well, I'm just saying, because he was talking about how difficult these licenses are. Right. And I'm like, well, you know, I know they limit them in, in, in communities. So there's a limited amount of liquor license right. you can have. Right. Um, I just wondered, I'd never explored the process of it. So yeah. I well, I, I think the main issue in this, uh, I guess I we should have asked that how we had still had Steve on the line. But, uh, it didn't occur to me. <laughs> sorry. But, uh, <laughs> but I think that more of the point is... Even if you invest the money in getting a liquor license and you go through the bureaucratic process right. of doing it, you're not risking your, 
you know future legal uh, you know health your your future freedom and your you know right. and your finances if you get a liquor license and no one's going to kick in your door. Right. Well, Whereas I was just, it, I was just looking know. at the end result, like, like right. uh, the tough to get aspect of it. Right. Still, there's so much gray area federally and in the state that I wouldn't even think about it. You know, in terms of a marijuana license? Yeah, there's just yeah. way too... There's, there's, I mean, the Fed gray area is Until, enough for to be like, well, forget it. I, I, I mean, if Michigan... I, you think of the, when the ballot... If the, if the ballot measure passes in November here in Michigan and the personal use goes into effect, I mean, we're in the same... We'll be in the same, uh, you know, classification as, say, Colorado, California, uh, you know, in terms of it's legal to own and use yep. in the state. Now, you are still dealing with the federal government that says it's illegal. So these states, so for instance, if you open up a, a marijuana shop in Colorado or California, you can't, I don't think you can take um, like credit card transactions or electronic tran- transfer, you can't use EBTs or anything like that. It's got to be all cash. Can't have a bank and account. You can't have a, a real bank account, so you have to use these, there's a special classification of bank that they use. Mm-hmm. And these shops, which as you can imagine are quite popular and have quite a lot of money, I mean, they have to transfer large amounts of cash that they cannot... It's like the do. Old West mining town it, it casinos. Is. Yes. <laughs> well, I mean, so that's the federal government basically getting in the way and, mm. and doing what they can. Or do. not getting out of the way. Or, yeah. Or, you know, that's because they're just a, a giant album. I think it's a combination of the two. I think in certain cases, you're right. It's them not getting out of the way. And in other cases, they're actually just actively getting in the way I mean, when they want to be dicks, especially with this administration. We're dealing with, uh, you know, an entire generation of people that saw, you know... Arnold from different strokes to sit on Nancy Reagan's lap, <laughs> and Mr. T said, "This this shit will kill you." Right? You know, and how do you combat Mr. T? Right? <laughs> I mean, how do you combat nostalgia? Right. And that's that's right. The, that's the big enemy. But those kids of the eighties of the just say no generation, they're the parents now, right? And uh, I seem to recall a lot of my compatriots of that age getting high, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> but. How big was that group? Yeah, you know, I forgot. So we there's, there's high. still, you know, there's still people out there that are like, that's the horrible gateway drug. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. Like, yeah. No, yeah. But, you know, I mean, uh, yes, and, and Steve was right. It goes way back. You I know, mean, it was the the, the Anheuser Busch family is the family responsible for stigmatizing. Oh, there's yeah. There's all we could do. A, we could do a whole show right. about about marijuana history. Um, but yeah, I mean, featuring John Arkin <laughs> as your host, <laughs> My live reenactment. <laughs> this is a bomb. <laughs> so um, uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of that stigma, in ter- like you said, the, the just saying no misinformation. It's a disinformation campaign. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. From its, uh, its propaganda from the know, very beginning. Uh, uh, b- b- look, I, I, you, when you look at it, like this, I'm a parent now. I have teenagers. So here's the thing. I smoked marijuana when I was younger, quite a lot. <laughs> I've been pretty open about that. I don't Some amazing no, stories. No, no secrets. Uh, I don't want my kids smoking pot. I don't want them to smoke pot. I really you, don't. You don't want them to drink. You, you don't, don't want them to do anything I mean, harmful. Well, right. And, and I recognize that you know the, the effects that it you know can have. I think any smoke you hold within your lungs of any kind is not good. I mean, it's all carcinogenic in that right. sense. So yeah, I, I get it on that level. But uh, I see it as like, okay, it's my job to deal with my kids, not to deal with your kids or society in general. So I, the whole point of like banning marijuana to protect my kids when, and probably just better off, why don't I just, I don't know, fucking talk to my kids. Yeah. Okay? Well, All right, stop, is, stop everything. This the, is, we jumped the shark. Okay. And the big thing is, is, is the most important I was thing hypothetical. I was about hypothetical. the marijuana issue in your kids is you don't want them going to jail for the rest of their life for having an ounce on it. Well, you, you know, right. So right. That, you, you, from your perspective, yeah. Right. You know, you know from, what I mean? From a crazy person's perspective, it's because it's going to get them into meth. Well, uh, yeah, exactly. The, the, it, it should not be wrecking people's lives. No. I mean, it, they they wreck people's lives more over marijuana than they do with alcohol related, with mm-hmm. many other <laughs> terrible, terrible well, crimes. Because of a and, wonderful and, lobby. And, and they come up to a guy who's peacefully, you know, sitting in the park. Singing Kumbaya, and you know, say he's the biggest well, criminal that we have in America. Right. That's suspicious, right there. <laughs> right, 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 singing Kumbaya. Stone liberals, man. <laughs> Stone you know what they do? They lay in front of your door and let you into your office. <laughs> That's annoying. And it can go right back to this children immigration thing, and how quickly the police will will turn and just say, "Oh yeah, that's the law. Let's just lock them up." 
I mean, they, police have discretion. They are using yeah. those things oh, yeah. as a revenue source, as a, yeah, you know, absolutely. I'm doing my job source, you know, make sure the budget is but big source. This is an interesting so problem. But this is an interesting issue with the forfeiture part of that. And, but, uh, and the, this is where I think conservatives and liberals slash progressives, some, they, this is an issue they sometimes meet on. Mm-hmm. Uh, sometimes. Uh, especially when it comes to the forfeiture laws that are attached to these drug laws. Um, and you're beginning to see some of the diehard conservatives, the Tea Party-ish end of the of the Republicans, uh, who are very much against yeah, uh, you point. know the forfeiture laws. And, and so sometimes they are in line with progressives who want to see these laws uh, you know abolished or, or altered or otherwise. But um, you know, it, ultimately, again, it's going to come back to the federal government. It, it has to change at the federal level for this to truly be a safe activity, or at least to be an acceptable activity where no longer is your, you know, your 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 legal, you're not in legal peril. Because right now, again, if the federal government wants to, they don't. But if they want to, they can arrest you. Yeah. You're not supposed to have any marijuana, according right. to the federal government. It's right. a Schedule Two drug, I believe, okay. on par with heroin. Yeah, I mean, it is. One, it's yeah. whatever it is. Yeah. It's fucking ridiculous yeah. to say that those are the same. And it has, and they, and you know, within that definition is of, you know, what those drugs are is it has no medical purpose. Right. And that's already been proven as wrong, and that should be just completely changed up as the law. And as soon as that happens, that's when you know the 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 bottle can get uncorked. Yeah, I saw. I need some people to die first. Yeah, yeah, probably. I saw, <laughs> or, I saw a story not that right. I saw a story not that long ago. It was talking about uh, you know drug education methods, and of course there's this the straight up just say no, which is still being kind of hammered home. All things. You know, just say no, just say no. Right? It, it's like abstinence only sex education, same right. thing, and it it's proven to largely be ineffective. It doesn't fucking work. Every time I heard it, I you just know. said yes. <laughs> right. And it didn't even matter what the drug was. Right, you know, like, whatever. Oh, let's try it. Exactly. <laughs> they said that's bad, so it's gotta be good. When it comes to marijuana, specifically, I, I was reading a story, there was a, 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 a pilot program where, instead of saying just say no, the approach was just wait. They took the approach of, talking right. to kids, saying, you know, there's a lot of studies that say adolescent brains are in development until you're about 18, 19 years old. If you wait beyond that period of time to start trying marijuana, you're going to reduce the medical effects uh, that it might have on you. Mm -hmm. And so just using that approach to say, you know what, just wait a little bit. We're not saying don't use it at all, and we're not saying it's evil and it's going to, you know, you're going to go murder your neighbor. Uh, We're just saying wait on it. And the interesting thing about that was the, 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 the study that they did was more kids five years after that type of education were still not using marijuana. A, a high, much higher percent just didn't use it because right. oh. you got a little bit more mature, you get into college, right. you, you, if you haven't started by then, then you know, you've know you got moved on to other things and you're a little mm-hmm. bit more mature in your life, so maybe you won't. I mean, it's the concept of the forbidden fruit. You know, why is alcoholism so bad here, but it's virtually non-existent in Western Europe? Right, yeah. Mainly because it's introduced early and there's no stigma. Like, you want some wine? Have some wine, kid. That's fine. That's not. Whatever. You know, here, this is what this tastes like. And uh, here, yeah. since we put the stigma on it, it's forbidden. And things that are taboo, we want. Oh, you yeah. tell me I can't? Oh, I'm going to do it. That's the first thing I'll do. That's just human nature. Yeah. Right, and that's why yeah. John's family grew up with largely water-filled liquor bottles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> they still don't know. They haven't touched yeah, them they, yet. They They're the, the same they, bottles. My dad still doesn't know. Shut up. It's the <laughs> same liquor cabinet. <laughs> he, hasn't, he hasn't switched it out at all. Did you go so far that you had to find the food coloring? Oh, God. I mean, mm, no. That was way too you, much work. No, that, yeah. was, that, was, that was too much work. <laughs> He'd rather convince his mom that something dastardly happened. All these people broke in, they're like these Cuban terrorists. And they took all your bows. Oh, that's terrible, John. Are you safe? <laughs> <laughs> Who told? <laughs> well, so. you. Yeah. <laughs> like I said, if we ever have a podcast. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> so... That'll be a different episode, different episode. Well, interesting conversation. Failing up would be the name of that podcast, <laughs> and we could just all tell stories of how big <laughs> losers we are. Oh my god! Why? Yeah, or tales from the other side in terms of like uh, 
why am I still alive? Because <laughs> clearly there is several instances where I should have died and did not. <laughs> we like to call that the 70s. That's pretty much the 20th century in general. Then you just describe that adolescent brain thing. Where, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's hard, it's hard for true. the adolescents to yeah. understand what danger is. <laughs> that story, if there's ever that podcast, it's going to lead off with John playing Oscar Goldman. <laughs> yeah. As in the Bionic Man, which is my favorite story. Oh, some, time. some other time, some other time. Some other time. We have a lot of other things to I talk about. I would think about. this administration, so we're going to head in that right Yeah, we're, let's make this switch. I would switch. think that this administration would be very pro-marijuana um, use, because all of his ex-paid-off girlfriends yeah. um, seem to dabble. Yeah. Right. So. Well, I mean, did you see what he said about the opioids? Was, we're going to make a video, and, yes, yeah. and we just yeah. want it to stop. Just make it stop. We're going to cut it. We're going to be really tough. We're going to make it hard for you to get the opioids. But there's no limit on how many pharmacies there are in a town. No. There are. No, no. <laughs> there are. Uh, there was that one town, I think it was in Virginia, West Virginia, that was a town of 30,000, and then over the last five years, it's done millions of Oxycontins and, and opioids down there and they're just filling up a whole town and some doctor or somebody down there is writing scripts and everybody's yeah. oh. just going loopy, loopy. Pharmaceutical industry you know. in the main companies, <clears throat> they doctor shop They mm-hmm. and they actually they just out and out bribe the doctors. Mm-hmm. They do what they call these speaker bureaus sure. where they say to the doctors, oh, you know, if you're one of our main prescribers, you get to join our speakers bureau where we'll pay you an obscene amount of cash to show up at the Ramada Inn in room A and speak to a group, and and then they just pay them like two hundred fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars to come speak to like four people yep. who are probably all employees of the pharmaceutical company anyway, and sit there, and then they and it's just it's just a it, it, you know it's just a, a, a method to try and, and to not try but to successfully bribe these doctors, and mm-hmm. they write these scripts ridiculous amounts that have no bearing on reality whatsoever. Right? It, I think there's just, one video that would work. We showed the P video. And say, this is what happens if you take Oxycontin. Mm. You get peed on by Russian hookers. (laughs) And very few people would probably take them up on that. That's got to be like a a narrow little fetish. Right. I don't know. Don't forget, the. the, (laughs) by the way, I just want to correct this. We've got a lot to talk about, uh, our fine president, uh, and all of his great accomplishments this week. Lots of Uh, accomplishments. Lots of accomplishments. But just don't forget, the the, the whole thing about the peeing was, they didn't pee on him. They peed on him. To have them pee on a mattress that Obama and and his wife slept on when they visited Moscow. Right. Which, to me, is is fucking weirder. Yeah, it's way (laughs) worse. That is... I mean, it really is. That's just... That's twisted. Yeah. I mean, getting peed on, okay, that's not my cup of tea, but uh, all right, sure. You know, it's a sexual fetish, and I know people are in, okay, whatever, it's your thing. But to pay them to pee on a mattress that your predecessor... What the what if your you? What if your sexual fetish is actually um, denigrating places Obama's been at? <laughs> well, it must be. And because he's, he fucked up the White House. Right. You're peeing on mattresses. <laughs> Canada. Apparently Obama liked Canada. Yep, so that's got to go. That's out. That's a yeah. Germany. Fuck you. That Trudeau guy, that French-looking white Obama, right. he's out of there. Uh, let's see, he didn't get along with Netanyahu, so I'm going to go to Israel and do whatever they want. <laughs> whatever you want. It's all yours. Didn't get along with uh, uh, North Korea. Ah, let's shake a hand. No, we've denuclearized everything. <laughs> I did it. Yeah. So let's let's start there. Oh, first. shall we? That's the uh, big news this week, of course. The big summit. And you knew it worked because Dennis Rodman cried. <laughs> Dennis Rodman also cried when he got ejected from the playoffs, so there's there's that. I cried (laughs) watching Dennis Rodman cry. Uh, So, yes, the the big summit, uh, of course, all the build-up to this, and then about 24 hours before it happened, uh, the White House suddenly saying, oh, he's only going to be there for a day, and uh, probably nothing substantive will come out of this, just so you know. And sure enough, he was only there for about a day, day and a half, Mm -hmm. and then... They had lunch, and then they signed basically an agreement that everything that had already been agreed to was still agreed to. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, you know, yeah, the, this, this promise of denuclearization has happened eight different times in the past, right? yeah. and it's never taken root. Um, the, the, best, the, the, the best part for me, and it wasn't even Trump doing his shit, because we know he's going to be an idiot, are the trumpeteers championing this guy as bringing peace. Mm-hmm. He has brought pe- finally peace. We can live without fear of North Korea anymore and Russia. 
But those fucking Canadians. Right. <laughs> that, really, that's, you're right. We should back it up just a couple of days prior to the summer. Because, right, he, he jets off to the G7 in Montreal. G6 and uh, the plus one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, on, we're, on the, we're on our way out. We are plus we were we're, Canada's plus we're, one. We're on probationary he's, he's status. He's double probation. <laughs> yeah, and so he goes there, and, you know, I, the whole tariff issue, obviously going to be a point of contention. And he goes there, and it, I, I can't really be surprised. Uh, but doubles down on his dickishness, uh, and then gets into a fight with Trudeau, of course, after he leaves, <laughs> right. and Trudeau says, well, uh, look, we're going to, you know, we'll have to implement our own uh, tariffs, and he said it was disappointing that we couldn't, you know, come to any kind of agreement with the president, couldn't see, couldn't get any kind of dialogue going with him. So, of course, Trump, who's supposed to be this macho man, he only can criticize people when he's gone. When he's out, he does it by Twitter. I mean, such a coward. Oh yeah, and he can't do it to and it Trudeau's wasn't even face. Him. It was a uh, Kudlow. Well, it was, it was both of them, right? But and Kudlow, but Kudlow, Kudlow and, and then Kudlow. yeah, and then uh, yeah. we have a problem with you. I know. On we show. really just you know Merrick Garland, Garland Merrick. We never quite get Mueller, any, Mueller, it, 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 whatever. <laughs> what the hell is wrong with us? <laughs> All right, so <laughs> <laughs> add that to the list. Yeah, we don't know. Yeah, we don't know. All right, um, right, and then afterwards, uh, right, saying that so, yeah, uh, there's a special place in hell, special place for, in for hell. Justin Trudeau. Okay, so I get you might not like the guy. Maybe he's not your cup of tea. Maybe you think he's a duplicitous sort of Canadian where he's got some business going on, on one side, and but he, he's a really nice guy to the people. He's a decent human being, and there's a little special place in hell for him. Right, you know? if hell existed, they would be like Justin. They, even Satan's like Justin Trudeau. I get him. Damn! I don't think he got achievement unlocked. You know, that's, <laughs> that's, that's Lucifer right now. But see, that got all the religious people thinking. What did Justin Trudeau do yeah. to deserve to be in hell? Now they're like constantly on their mind trying to save Justin Trudeau or make him perish one way or the other. If you come to our side, we can help you, Justin. Just get rid of all those nasty things that you're doing those over tariffs. there. Yes. Well, the liking the gays and... and <laughs> yeah. Being a human yeah. being. How being dare you, like sir? Women. You How like dare women. you? There's women well, on your... What about the bocce, though? The instant karma? There's a special place in hell yeah. for Justin Trudeau. Oh, God, my heart. <laughs> <laughs> he has a heart attack the next yeah. day. I kind of wonder. Uh, that's a... Uh, Prolonged Trump exposure is like radiation. Uh, I'm, I'm not one to believe in in, in extra, you know, worldly uh, beings, but that does make you go. Oh. Hmm. Karma. Well, I mean, Sarah Huckabee Sanders is the proof that there's no extra worldly beings. <laughs> so, so there's the report she's out by the end of the year. Right, and what made it uh, all the more, uh, I think, uh, uh, a lock that she's going to be gone is that she then immediately denied it. Yeah. <laughs> so you're like, of course uh, that's not true. you're gone. <laughs> the minute they go, oh, no, there's nothing to that. Uh-huh. Okay. See, they're going to put Miller out there. And that's when the, the, the boat will really fucking turn over. You know, <coughs> he'll, he'll just stand up there like uh, uh, during. So, might as well just come out dressed like him but, at this you know, point. Why not? Why I, not? Why would come out dressed like Trump? <laughs> like everyone starts to assimilate oh, Borg like. And that's so we can tell who's really, who's really, you know, in tune. See, I would have a lot more respect for that. <laughs> just walking up if like, you did come out like a Borg, she, you know, or Trump, yeah. just, have, just as a joke. I mean, just like, oh god, just, it's, well, I know. I then, know. But then the best part is that then when it filter down to the Trumpeteers, and they all start dressing like him, so like bad red ties and spray tans. Well, they're like, oh, there's one. Yeah. We can like identify them, and like, and they live. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, so back to the whole North Korea. Oh, North Korea, yes. Yeah, I just so the the point of this was was uh, so we we spit in the face of one of our closest allies, arguably the closest. Yeah, I mean, you know, we figuratively spit spit in their face. Then we jet off, we being Trump, jet off to Singapore so we can meet with a brutal dictator. And treat him with kid gloves and red carpet treatment. Salute his general. S- salute his generals. Uh, with this murderous, brutal dictatorship, um, where we, again, Donald Trump, give up a lot. I mean, just the meeting itself yep. was a concession. Yeah, to, and to, that's to what North most Korea. people don't get. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and somebody pointed out, and I was like, it, it, the obvious was they were like, uh, "Hello, dumbass, Obama, Bush." Clinton, they all could have met with North Korea's leader. It's not like anything was preventing them from doing that. 
They just weren't going to do it because it validates that, that in and of itself, it's a validation of a murderous dictatorship that has shown no sign of changing. And again, they've shown shown no sign of changing. So he at this summit, in complete surprise to the South Korean allies. Remember the South oh, Koreans? No. Okay, the ones that said this you know, up. Yeah, no. the ones who are mostly impacted by this. The ones who are supposed to be our allies that we're supposed to be protecting. Yeah, he. I mean, he says, "Oh, we're going to stop these uh, military exercises." Because uh, we're going to save a lot of money. Okay? I love how everything's about money with this idiot. Uh, as, you know, you can price tag out things like but that. But our deficit's about yeah, a million, oh my God. Zillion, uh, zillion. And, of course, the South Koreans were like, what? Oh, no. <laughs> no more fall for you. <laughs> so, uh, that was horribly. It was bad. It was yeah. bad news. Uh, um, anyway, so he gives up major concessions for literally nothing. They agreed to nothing that had not already been agreed to between the North and South Koreans uh, in April at Panmunjom. They, they basically agreed. The whole thing about denuclearizing the, the Korean Peninsula, as you pointed out, that's something that's been eight different times has been agreed to, stated on the record. That right. didn't change. The only thing he substantively came out of there with, and not really, but you, okay, was that the Korean North Koreans were committed to returning a, a couple of hundred remains of soldiers from the Korean War that, by the way, they've had, they didn't just find them, mm. they've had these remains, they're bargaining chips. Okay? Yeah. Just like the hostages that came home a few weeks ago. Sure. Those were bargaining, they were bargaining, they take them hostage as bargaining chips because they know that at some point, and he's played, uh, Kim Jong-un has played his hand very well. He was able to trade those hostages to get the meeting. Okay, yeah. ah, I got my meeting, yes. And now he's going to trade these remains if, for this red carpet treatment that he gets. It's all for, and, and, for him. Yeah, it's, it's all, not for the state of uh, uh, North Korea. This oh, is all for him. Oh yeah, yeah, and it, it legitimizes him further. It's a, it helps them with their prop, you know, propaganda uh, to their people. Oh, you know, we, they've defeated the, they've brought the Americans to their knees. But that's, here's the best that's part: the messaging right now in North. Oh, Korea. Oh, absolutely. Too, yeah. they, their messaging has nothing to do with what happened in Singapore. Oh, sure. <laughs> you know, no, it does everything. It, well, we got look right. what we got. We're we're number right. one. Actually, we're the U.S. Right actually, now. isn't that actually that's a great point. It's more. Safe. Their message seems to be more on track with actually what happened in Singapore than what we're getting elsewhere. Which is the first time that's happened. There. So here's the and so just to put a capstone on the whole thing about the remains. Uh, so yesterday, Trump in an interview says, "Oh, by the way, I had dozens, dozens of parents of Korean War killed come up to me on the campaign and ask if I could bring home the remains of their of their children." What? So somebody got out a calculator. And they said, okay, How the Korean War ended in 1953. Yeah. If the soldier was 18 and their parent was 18 when they had them, the youngest possible parent that could have spoken to him would have been 101 years old. So we've been scanning the uh, archive footage from the 2016 campaign of all these centenarians yeah. <laughs> <laughs> approaching. So Just again, a blatant, a blatant yeah. lie. So an easily disproven lie, a blatant lie. Uh, why would you tell that lie? Lie? Why would you tell that lie? For us, why? To, for us to chase our it's, tail for the next day and a half. It's just stupid. Not even that. Just, it's just, it's just, he just it's, lies. It's compulsive. It's, a, it's right. compulsive. But he knows that yeah. it works. That's why it doesn't. He doesn't ever. I don't stop. know. He's I, never been punished by. I lies. think in some instances. Ever. I think in some instances he yeah. he lies or says things that he knows will yeah. drive people crazy. I think this is one of those instances where it is just compulsive. He just. But, it's like, he just bah, bah, blah, blah. But and he's then, never been punished yeah. for lying. He I has. Mean, he I just mean, has never. He's never admitted it, though. Well, you know, like, he's going bankrupt so many times. All these horrible business dealings. He spins in his in his brain. I think he spins it like he won. Yeah. You know. So this is this is worse than lying on purpose. This is fucking. He believes it. Yeah. <laughs> And who wasn't, so just, come on, who wasn't hoping for a couple of Syrian assassins to blow death dust on him? Man, no kidding. Like, oh, here, this is Kim Jong-un. Ha! <laughs> 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 like, well, that's how I took out my brother-in-law, bitch! <laughs> I would like to just point out that there's Fox News called them both dictators. Yes. Yes. I forgot they, about that. They both went home and lied about what happened, what's in the document. Yeah. The yes. people around both of them were taken aback by those lies because they had already said other things about the actual document on both sides. Mm -hmm. And the timeline of this was Trump sent Pompeo over there in secret to get things going because yes. then once Trump knows Pompeo's got an in, he commissions the coin. 
The coin is now... Forgot about the coin. The coin is now minted. Forgot about the coin. Pompeo sends back his love to uh, to Donald saying we're all set we just got to put an away team together and we're gonna we're gonna get together with them one more time and then we're gonna have this summit the away team that was sent got stood up they were calling all day they're texting they're doing where's the North Koreans where's the North Koreans nobody shows day after Trump sends the letter we're not coming the North Koreans counter with, oh, well, that's funny. We'd love to have a meeting with you anytime. <laughs> Donald counters with, they begged me for this meeting. I guarantee you, guarantee you, after he got stood up, Trump was the one begging. For oh, yeah. Trump begged and pleaded to get this meeting so that he has this one thing that he can say that he did, just like Nixon. Only Nixon could go to China. It's a, it's a, you know, right. uh, he he was outside of the establishment, right, right, and, right, and and wouldn't and wouldn't play the games of the politicians. It's the same goddamn bullshit. Nothing happened in China. <laughs> Actually, got worse. <laughs> got worse. <laughs> Nothing's gonna happen in North Korea. Let's hope it doesn't if you get think worse. Think about the 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 history of the Korean War. Well, I'll disagree China, with you. China, China was always backing the North. <laughs> on this because they know what's up there. Right. They know what's happening there. Well, I'll disagree with you on China, uh, on Nixon going to China. Things did change for China. It was actually, I, I mean, I don't, I don't want to defend Richard Nixon, but <laughs> uh, but the genius of that maneuver, okay, which is why I think it's, in, in one sense, Trump is unable, incapable of any kind of, because it, it, by doing that, it was a it was a slap against the Russians, all right. By because you had the, these were the two major communist countries in the world, and he basically kind of went in between and sort of separated them out. Mm. And it, they, they were already kind of not on friendly terms, but to basically make this reproachment to China in a lot of ways, it 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 helped push forward. The detente with the Soviets and all the rest. That's a whole different thing. Right? That's a long that. game, though. But that's a long game. Thank you. That's that's more to the point. Yeah. And that's why, as a maneuver, it, it had merit. This whole thing with North Korea, there's no merit to it. Yeah, the long no, game for other, other than to Trump's ego. Like, mm-hmm. who knows if, if uh, Una's going to be in power next week? You know, I mean, right. dictators I mean, come and go. Yeah, well, just like our guy. Yeah. Uh, well, so, he just so pretty much you. goes where he <laughs> yeah. wants. So... So I that's thought, a, it's an interesting thing. Though. So the, this whole North Korea thing and the, and the Canadian uh, ire and all the, the the pouting at the G seven. Oh, and the German comments too. Oh yeah. Remember he yeah. said the ambassador went over there saying we're gonna we're gonna be on the side of the the, the people on the right against Merkel. Right. Well, you know, they, they, and it's just insane. What what are they doing other than changing the they're, alignment they're, of the powers of the world? They're trying to destroy from within. The, the alignment that's been in place for, for 50 See, plus years. But they're doing it insidiously. They're not doing it as a nation to nation. It's a personal attack. Right. Sure. It's right. personal attacks on national leaders, which we've never seen before. This is something completely different because he doesn't think in concepts of nations. He thinks in concepts of this guy wronged me. Yeah. And, you know, I'm going to get him back. I'm going to get her back. And that's so it, it's not sustainable, is what I'm saying. Um, Trudeau sees beyond it. Merkel sees beyond it. These are very smart people. Um, and and we can only hope that uh, uh, this ends at some point. I mean, because it, it's not a sustainable way to govern, right? Well, it's it's interesting that you say that because I, you know, I posted on the uh, on the um, uh, No Cry Facebook page, No Cry Zone Facebook page, and I, I just want to read this real quick because I think it's it's worthy entering into the record, so to speak, to kind of talk about what you're mentioning here. Um, and it was oh, a. I saw this. <laughs> it was a post from um, a, a conservative commentator. He's a. Uh, I'm digging for it now. You think I'd be prepared, but I'm not. Okay, Tom Nichols, uh, senior contributor to the conservative Federalist magazine, a lecturer at the Naval War College, and he put up this Twitter thread, which I strung together and, and put on our Facebook page. And basically, I just think it's it's a lot about what we deal with now. We have to keep in mind. He says, it's not that I disagree about policy with Trump supporters. It's that I know they don't give a shit about policy. Mm -hmm. There's no way to have a policy argument with people whose eyes are always looking up to the television for a cue from Dear Leader about what to say next. Trumpism is non-falsifiable. Whatever Trump does is right. There are no principled arguments to be had because if Trump changes his mind or tweets something off the wall, Trumpers change their position immediately. 
This would basically be a cult, except for one thing. Most Trumpers do not believe their own bullshit. Yes, some of them really are stupid enough to think Trump is a good man and all that crap, but most of them are only interested in Trump as a vehicle of social disruption. Trump's smarter enablers, and that was a phrase I thought was very interesting, his smarter enablers, see him as an equalizer, a way to put them on an equal footing with elites. Oh, that word. Who they think look down on them. Thing is, the elites do look down on them for good reason. Most of Trump's sycophants are second raters at best. For them, Trump is their shot. They know he's emotionally disordered, but they don't care. This is their chance to grab the car keys, throw a kegger before mom and dad get back home. That makes talking with them about policy impossible. So it's, if it seems like I don't engage Trump's enablers on the merits of this or that Trump policies because I can't take Trump's policies any more seriously than Trump or his minions do. It's either pure stupidity or pure careerism, and either way, it's a waste of time. And he, and he goes on to further solidify that argument. But and he's talking about Trump supporters. Yeah. But I think largely that same analysis applies to to Trump himself. I, sure. You, you mm-hmm. can't. Unfortunately, he has the power of the presidency, which is immense. But you can't take anything the guy's eroding daily, though. Yeah, which is well, nice. That's good to see. I mean, I would like. To, I, I mean, if anything comes out of this, I, 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 boy, I would like to see some balance restored to the three branches. But there's a, there's an interesting post I read the other day from uh, I think it was a repost from a friend. But uh, a guy comes into a gas station, he's got a fuck Trump sticker on there. And a Trump mm-hmm. supporter walks up to him and says, you know, uh, 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 essentially, we only voted for him. I don't even like the guy. I only voted for him because he pisses you off. Right. Stupid libtards. That's like the whole, mm-hmm. the, one, one of the, the main reasons these guys are out there. And that's when you're arguing on Facebook with people, you can pick out the policy idiots who are like way, way, right. looking for the right. cues, and the guys are just like, nah, I'm here to fuck with you. Mm-hmm. And you alone, because it makes you angry. Right. And I think there's more, I'm coming to the realization, there's more of them, the people that I think, there's the, the truly stupid. Yes. Um, and then there's the people that are just, they they, they get off on the, uh, the, the social disruption, if they will. It's a troll party. It is. And that's why, and I saw another interesting article, I was talking about how, you know, Robert De Niro at the Tonys came out and he said, fuck Trump. And then the audience gave him a standing ovation. And, and it was an interesting article that said, this is not, while that felt good, this is not a cogent argument for us to be having. This is not, a, this is not an effective method of resistance, mm-hmm. opposition for us to be doing. We need to be smarter than that. And he wasn't saying what, what De Niro did was bad or wrong or how dare he insult Trump. It had nothing to do with that. Right. It had everything to do with this is not smart. We need to be smart. We are smarter. We need to act smarter. See, that just empowers that base for the reasons. Exactly. You know, the same yeah. way the deplorables yeah. did. Sure. Right. And, and and while on a certain level you, you you can't like I can't worry about you know how they I, I just got to go about my business, but why why shake up the beehive? Right. You know uh, because unfortunately uh, you know Republicans vote more than Democrats. Yep. As a as a reliable voter turnout, they show up largely because they're older mm-hmm. and they're more prosperous. There's fewer of them Mm -hmm. than Democrats or people who would identify as Democrats or progressives. There's fewer of them, but they are much more reliable, especially in off-year elections when, you know, as we saw in 2010, where shit matters. And they show up. Three million less by my last count. And and they they figured (laughs) that out long ago, and they've been on a a mission to squelch the vote as much as possible. Yeah. Um, in order to make it harder and harder to get those masses to fight against them. So all of it has to mean that we have to put something together to show people, not tell them, that we are doing it better. Um, I, I'm, I'm in the middle of the Roosevelt, so we've gone through Teddy now, and we're into FDR, and and, and no, you're, you're watching. I'm this? watching this. Is uh, I'm in, uh, it's a it's a Ken Burns. Right. Documentary, okay. multi-part. So you'll be very done next long. year sometime. Yeah, <laughs> next year I'll, I'll surface. Um, but the whole point of it is, is, is those, those things that we we hope our country can be, have to be shown, not told, and it has to be action, not words alone that get us there. So FDR came into it. Shit, people everywhere didn't have a job. There was 
people hungry. There was, you know, signs up that says, keep on trucking. We know we can't even take care of our own. Just keep on going away. And that's what state our country was in. And he just started doing shit here in our country. The Hoover Dam, the, you know, all of these huge projects trying to get our people to work. And what he did was show them, this is what I'm doing not talking about, oh, I'm going to go fight it out in the legislator, legislature for the next three months. I'm going to make this happen, and just like kind of uh, 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 the ACA. We're going to make this happen and then make you strip it away from us. Right, you except know? the difference is an interesting thing about FDR was, I mean, you're right, he came into a crisis like no other. I mean, capitalism was on the ropes. Yeah. I mean, it was there was real question about whether <clears throat> the country was going to survive, whether it was going to survive as a capitalist all the reasons country. capitalism should be on the ropes, which is greed and, right. and, 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 and mm -hmm. underhandedness. But he came in in those first hundred days, and you're right. He just said, we're fucking, I don't care, I'm not, and I'm not interested in building some coalition. I'm interested in getting shit done. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to use my legislative uh, mandate, which he had. He had overwhelming majorities in both houses. And he took those first hundred days, and he got shit done. Yeah. Uh, that, you know normally would not would be very hard to do otherwise and when you look at the ACA under Obama and I, I, I I've said this before and I still think it's true I have to think and I, I understand why you can't say this publicly but I have to think that Obama privately wishes he would have done the ACA a little bit differently sure. which was he would have just immediately come in and said yeah. we're gonna do it and by the way we're gonna do single payer I've got the majorities in the House and Senate and mm -hmm. fuck you yeah and we're doing it and we're just going to get it going, and once people get it and enjoy it, because even the modest change they made with ACA, which is an old Republican plan, mm -hmm. but yet people almost immediately, once they understood that Obamacare and the ACA were the same thing, they actually liked it. Mm -hmm. you know. And now we're, he's, here you got Trump trying to strip away these individual provisions. So here's something to be thankful for, then. With majorities in both houses, we're not changing more. Yeah, well. You know, in the wrong direction. This could be the anti FDR. He could be RDF. Yeah. <laughs> RDF. <laughs> Real dumb fuck. Well, yeah, that works too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, but anyway, the the, the 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 spirit of the nation can be changed with action. Um, his very first speech, his first fireside chat taught people about the banking system for 44 minutes, I believe it. And then, two days prior to him creating this banking holiday, because the banks were all closing and he didn't know if he could stuff enough cash in there to keep all the deposits, you know, covered, right. Right. He, cl he claimed this, this banking holiday, got out and, and had a fireside chat, and the day after, they started depositing their money again because he talked to them. This is what we're going to do. This is why I've done it. This is our plan. We're going to go and do this. I need your help to do it. It's a different age. And it, and it happened. I don't think so. Oh, I think that's exactly what Trump so, does. It's no, just in a different. But it's in a different reality star way. But no, it's not what he because not that the majority of people don't buy into it. But he is speaking to his his followers. So, there's a difference. Uh, FDR he has followers. To everyone. Right. Yeah. FDR there's did, no yes. way we speak to everyone anymore. There's so much disinformation and misinformation shoved in people's faces all the time. That's a, it's an impossible. That was when the radio was the, the entertainment home, yeah, of right. the home. Yeah, they there, also, there was nothing. You, you got around, you sat around it as a family uh, or individually, and you listened. And the person on the radio, if they made it to the radio, that meant they were important. Mm -hmm. There was ethos involved with being, just being on the radio. That's why Orson Welles almost destroyed New York. Right. Are you saying people that are on the radio now are not important? Exactly. What the fuck? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's 100% true. As a former radio personality mm -hmm. myself, uh -huh. Uh, yeah, it, 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 it moves the needle to a you're certain saying, amount of You're saying any Tom, Dick, and Harry can just be on the radio? Or have a podcast. And any Mike, John, or Dave, too. <laughs> yeah, well, <maybe>. <laughs> Go on. And so that's so we are, we're, we're, we keep going back to the Internet and how it's changed everything. It has changed everything. And most of all, it's changed messaging. Mm -hmm. As a communications instructor, taking this into account means, wow, the world has changed. There's no way. There used to be, uh, who was, I can't even think of his name. Um, Walter, not Walter Cronkite. Damn big news guy. Big, big news guy in the 60s. Cronkite. Cronkite. Walter Cronkite, at the time, was voted the most trusted man in America. Mm -hmm. Because he was allowed on television. There's three channels. 
He was the news guy. He was telling you about the world. The fact that, that important people put him on TV to talk to me means he is trustworthy. That is completely gone. There's, it's it's uh, like the menu at a, a restaurant. If the menu is too big, you can't decide. The menu is way too big for our channels now. So there's no way we're going to get one person to come on and change the world. It won't. You're right. A fireside chat is not going to happen anymore. I mean that 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 method. But it could certainly be a much better. Like I I think of the ACA. Like right after that, all you ever heard from the Democrats, like they they ran scared. Like mm-hmm. oh my God, this was so bad for us. We'll never be reelected. They should have embraced it. Every single representative should have been out there with that same message. And then, yes, David, it wouldn't have been one person, FDR, telling you, uh, you know, as you're walking down the street, the whole street is echoing with FDR's words. No, it's not going to happen like that. It's but you know, I, 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 it's just, but still, adventure. but still, you know, let's say all let's say all the Democrats embraced it. Mm-hmm. Every single Democrat embraced it. That doesn't stop the counter messaging, right? FDR, and at that time, the, the, when things worked, there was no counter messaging. No, there was. But here's, and yeah, here's, they were calling them a but here's the, the they were, but they didn't have a. Platform. Here's the difference. So in 2010 or 2012, when Democrats were not embracing the ACA as a, as, a, as an election platform, you're right. They were running from it. Mm-hmm. They should have. It not. was largely because, but I think the interesting difference is because now they are. Now Democrats yeah. are very much. The difference was not very many people had experienced it yet. Mm -hmm. Not many people were on the ACA and had actually enjoyed its benefits yet. Now that they have, and suddenly people are like, I like this provision of uh, my kids are covered till they're 26. Hey, I like this, you know, uh, pre-condition, you know, exclusion. I, I, you know, I I like that. Mm -hmm. Same with the CCC camps. I mean, people thought that was like... Stalin coming in. I mean, FDR's creating camps. I still think. Oh my God! No, don't get me wrong. I still think Democrats made a mistake in not moving forward with promoting the ACA. And they, running from it was a mistake. Yeah. They should have been out there because the, the counter messaging would have still been there and it would right. have been negative, and it was. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we're talking, remember death panels? I mean, oh, yeah. you know, that's what you were running oh, yeah. up against. And the counter message. I mean, we needed. We needed, They needed a probably coalition. Here's the here's the biggest difference though between how we messaged uh, uh, through. The depression and how we message now. The depression, this country was at arguably its lowest point. Mm-hmm. Even with Trump in right now and through Obama, we're re- we've been rel- even during the recession, people are relatively prosperous compared to the depression. We don't have there's there's, there's the sense of desperation isn't there. I mean, there was this, there is, was, this is all ideological. Right. Shit. There was a sense of desperation in in oh eight oh nine. Yeah, when it first hit, you know, and then people thought, oh wait. Oh, we're all not, all not going to die. It's, and then it's, it's, it's going to be rough, but right. we'll get through it. Uh, this was not sitting with your kids starving in Kansas. Right. Levels of desperation. Right. Oh no, I'm not trying to compare the two. Yeah, no, no, yeah. of course. So that would have been the closest. So that's yeah. so so that's that's see when that happens. That's when a sing, that if that happened again, a single figurehead could rise with a good message to to fix things. But we're not desperate. We have the luxury of hate. We have the luxury of not liking somebody. Okay. I have the luxury of going, my president sucks. And I'm going to say it right now, and I think he should get out of there. Because we're relatively prosperous. We have the luxury of being able to, to bitch about this shit. So, until we get to that dust bowl point, let's just work on doing the best thing we can do. Because we're coming. It's coming. <laughs> Just saying, <laughs> we're, we're we're heading toward it. We're hurtling toward it. Waiting, waiting, <laughs> waiting. And I'm gonna wait in Rob's barn because there's so many. There's new every time. I look around and there's like a new display. <laughs> and then some. But this is like if there was an archaeological dig in here, mm-hmm. it would be like the history of Rob's projects. And, and there's the newest layers, all the way down. And it's layered too. There was another barn here before. Oh, absolutely. No, there was. There's a Mayan barn. <laughs> it's two built on top of with a bunch of abandoned Mayan projects. My favorite one right now is those lights now with the rush pictures, but that's obviously on top of the leg of a table that was part of something, which is. <laughs> you know what? I didn't even. I was like, oh, that's a pretty cool display thing. You and then I, re- you're right. That's a table. Leg. It's a sedimentary <laughs> layers of projects. <laughs> We have the luxury to abandon projects now. That table leg in 1938 would have been burned for fuel. Have you ever tried to make a tapered table leg before? No. Like a wood shop or anything? It's a bitch. 
I mean, it's hard to make them really good. You got to have a really good equipment and really good clamps. Did you you got to be able one? to shove it through there and, and make it good. I didn't make it. No, that's what but I, I can't good. throw one away now that I've tried to make one. Ah. You know what I mean? I'm, uh, You've funny. come to appreciate it. Yeah, I've come to appreciate the taper, tapered table <laughs> leg okay. as a as a design element. Okay, okay. It's, it's now a table ta leg. Now tapered table <laughs> okay. leg is a design element. Is cool, but tapered table leg as the basis for the rush pictures. That's just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> that's just, I didn't feel like taking the table leg now. And yet you've, <laughs> you've, you've, you've given them lighting. You've got blue lighting on. Oh, so they no, changed. The light changes. Oh, and, oh, yeah. I see. It's perfect. Yeah. So that's new. That's uh, that's what wow. I noticed. And then I started like it's the history of like Rob's. What he hasn't done, the things, the history of what Rob hasn't finished. <laughs> well, that I'm finished with. We're in. <laughs> he's done. He's done. And done. Oh, he's done. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like this is the equivalent of your South Korea, your North Korea summit. We did great things. Table leg. Table leg. <laughs> and we're <laughs> out. <laughs> this song is called "Baby Don't You Cry." Find more episodes of The No Cry Zone at thenocryzone.com. Tweet Rob, John, and Dave at No Cry Zone. And find The No Cry Zone on Facebook. Listen to every Abnormal Entertainment show on Google Play, Apple Podcasts, our YouTube channel, or anywhere you find your favorite podcasts. And don't forget to visit abnormalentertainment.com. You've been listening to the Abnormal Entertainment Network.